Welcome to your D132 Typography 1 and I'm going to go over the chapter on digital type or the name of the chapter is called Type in a Digital Environment in your Exploring Typography ebook just to try to clear things up a little bit in case you find it very technical and not really making sense. A lot of this terminology actually comes from the 90s, the 2000s. It's kind of more of a history of digital type as well so it may not be subject matter that you're dealing with on an everyday basis. I've dealt with this stuff because I started with graphics back in the 90s and kind of worked my way up learning about all this stuff. I used type managers. I knew about screen fonts and outline fonts and all that stuff, but this may not mean a lot to you. So let me just kind of clear up the chapter for you as I go through. And they talk about screen typography and they talk about output devices. Now, a printer is an output device because it outputs something from your computer. Your monitor is actually an output device because it's outputting information from your computer but it's doing it on a screen and it's doing it with pixels and early computer monitors did not have a lot of colors their resolution wasn't very high so you had issues with resolution and resolution is basically the grid of pixels and a big problem was with type because type wouldn't look good on screens and they had to make type that worked for the screen grid they had to add anti-aliasing to make type look better but type never looked good on screen because of low resolution and that was always an issue that had to be adjusted and it works a lot better now because we have higher resolution screens and we have outline fonts but let me just go through this a little bit more so in the beginning they talk about pixels you should be familiar with pixels when you're working in Photopea or Photoshop basically it's it's raster meaning everything is basically little little dots really either either dots on a screen or dots on paper even your output device a printer is printing out dots and your screen is using pixels but they, they're using a similar kind of technology because they're basically just using a grid to do that now now when we talk about screens now input is one thing now they start talking about input here legibility on screen it's always been an issue and let's just keep going through here and try to find some of the things and it's because of this it's because smaller type would have a hard problem because of the grid if you didn't have as many pixels the smaller type you get it wouldn't really have a lot of clarity to what's going on the bigger type there would be a lot of pixels to do it almost like with images as well and if anything was smaller than 10 points it would have a problem on screen so they came up with different fixes there were even special screen fonts to do this and let's just keep going through here there was even one I remember called mini 7 that was actually a screen font you'd use on a web page for fonts that were like 7 point or something like that you could use it and uh, on the old Macs there were screen fonts called Chicago New York Monaco Geneva charcoal uh, that, that were designed for the interface. They were on your menus. These things up here along the top, they were all part of your interface and they were designed for the screen so they would look good on screen. Uh, unlike body copy on a web page or something or if you were designing something in Word, they often wouldn't look good. They would look very jagged. So there were fonts designed for the screen. And where you would have problems is with different type styles like italics because they had a lot of angles on them they would get kind of jaggy because obviously the shapes look better when they were straight lines up and down perpendicular just like if you draw a square it doesn't matter what the resolution is but if you draw a circle then you're gonna see all the jaggies around the curves and same thing would happen italics would look very jagged bold styles would lose kind of their their white space in between so you had to be careful with styles that you used on screen and sometimes even memory wise, I remember certain software applications would just gray out the text at small sizes because they couldn't even render text at small sizes. You would just see kind of gray stripes going across. Condensed fonts didn't look good on screen. Even, even extended typefaces, although they look fine here, would create a problem. Usually what you'd have to do, you'd have to expand the tracking a little bit on screen. And even the letting sometimes would make things a little bit better on screen. Anything to make them look less crowded and less jumbled together would kind of help. And they, they mentioned some things here about spacing. They mentioned for optimal on-screen legibility, increase the tracking slightly and increase the letting. That's the paragraph line spacing is the letting. That it'll keep things from being kind of jumbled together and more muddy. And they have something called measure, which is actually line length. Because you don't want to read across the screen very far back and forth. It gets very tiring. You want to use short line lengths like newspapers and magazines always use short line lengths because it's easier for readers to go across the screen and come back and read like that you don't want to read a long way across the screen and it's even harder to do that on a computer so measure is the is the line length really keeping that short also paragraph size have multiple short paragraphs rather than really long paragraphs so these are all the things for on-screen legibility and that means if you're designing web pages and things like that you want to try and do that
and follow these specific guidelines here. And again, this is coming very historically. Things have changed, so monitors have changed, displays have changed, and even the fonts have changed. So either way, these are still great guidelines to follow when using typography in any situation in order to maintain readability. Now, they're talking about folds and things like that. I won't get into that right now because that's talking about print and digital, and we don't have to really deal with that right now. Uh, color, because there could be colors that really bounce off each other. Remember, warm colors are going to come forward. Cool colors are going to recede. I'll put something in red because it's very important. It's like a warning. But in some cultures, red means something else. I think they even mentioned here that it can mean celebration in Asian cultures where we kind of do it as an anger kind of thing. So just be aware of that, I, I guess, if you're in social context. But just keep in mind that warm colors will come forward. Cool colors will recede, just like in art. That's a kind of a color temperature that we talk about. And I always talk about contrasting color temperatures. Using warms and cools together is always a nice contrast. Uh, they go well together instead of using two cools. Just if, if you're putting clothes together, an outfit, it's probably better to, you know, kind of use warm and cool kind of contrast to go together. They talk about the warm, cool kind of thing. Then they talk about interactivity and usability a little bit. I'm not going to go into that a whole lot. Uh, we're not really talking about usability. That would be something probably in an interface design class uh, with a web that we'd probably talk about more. But navigational concerns, one thing they do mention about here is navigational clues. If you're designing for the web, uh, be consistent, use visual hierarchies. You know, some of these things are interface design kind of issues about menus, about hyperlinks. Sometimes they'll say keep your underlines on hyperlinks so people know they're hyperlinks. And don't use underlines for emphasis because people are used to seeing them as hyperlinks. So there's other things here to, to be aware of. The one thing I think in the quiz I mentioned is visual hierarchies. And you want to make sure that people understand what's most important and what's less important. Visual hierarchies based on the way you set up your navigation will help people navigate a website. So I think that's the most important thing here is that kind of stuff. Uh, the visual hierarchies, making sure you do that, and making sure you're consistent about that. That's why HTML has H1 and H2 because they, they go by hierarchies. They go by what's most important to least important important in terms of size. So you should always try to do that when you're designing anything. And that goes for print work too. You still want to have visual hierarchy. So that's very important. That's why I think I specified that more than anything out of this. Now they talk about fonts on the web. I don't know if there's a whole lot for us to do now. Even though when we use Gravit, we're using web fonts. But you know, way back in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, or even when web started out more in the 2000s, they used embedded fonts. Uh, that, that was actually meant that when, when you go to a web page, it could actually use that font. They can actually load it and use it. Now, what became easier then is these kind of type kit. Adobe became popular with this type kit. And even now, Google fonts is kind of the, the equivalent now that you'll see for that. But a lot of times you have to pay for that. All the Google fonts is free. So kind of the modern version of this kind of stuff is the Google fonts. And I don't even think they mentioned Google fonts in here. Uh, SIF, I've never even dealt with that. Now, web fonts were designed to look good on screen. Their italics look good. They just are designed to look better at smaller sizes. And a lot of the Google fonts are web fonts as well. So you'll see those a lot more. And they are actually implemented by using them from a server. They're stored on Google server and you specify them in CSS to use them on a web page. Now, let's talk about font formats. This is something more historical. Now, they talk about bitmap or raster fonts. Now, early computers, everything was composed of bitmaps. And instead of scaling them, you actually had to have fonts that were designed in all different sizes. Just like old letterpress fonts, they had to come in different sizes. That's why everything is like 10 point, 12 point, uh, 18 point, 24, because they only used them in certain increments. They didn't have every single font, so that, that's why you didn't design anything with 23 point size or something like that, because you didn't have that font size. You had to use 24, you had to jump up to 30, you had to jump up to 36. That's the way fonts worked with letterpress, and bitmap fonts kind of worked like that too. When they started working on screen, you only had certain sizes that you could work with or certain sizes that would render nice on screen, and that was because they were all designed with pixels like that. And what really changed things was outline or vector fonts, and eventually true type fonts. And let me just show you something, what they're talking about here. You know what vector is, I think. Uh, it's vector technology. This is Gravit. Now here's a font, and I could change the font size and everything, and change the color using the font. But this says this is outlines. It's actually not. But if I go here and convert it to outlines, or convert it to path, which I can do, what actually happens is I can't change the font anymore. I can't change the spelling. But what I can do now is I can actually go in here and 
I'll zoom in so you can see what's going on here, I could actually adjust anchor points. So this is the outline file that has all that information. It turns it basically into an object. So it basically creates the font out of letters that are composed of outlines. And what happens, they talk about hinting, and you might think, well, what that, what's hinting? Basically, if you think about rasterization, everything that you do on screen, if, even if you have outline fonts, even if you're designing stuff in Gravit and it's all outline work or vector work that you're doing, when it prints out, or even when it goes to your screen, it, it's really raster. I mean, printers are raster. They print out dots, and your screen is raster because it basically shows pixels. So there's a transformation that goes from this math vector. All these things are, are based on math. It's like, it's like trigonometry, if you ever paid attention to trigonometry. Uh, in math class. It's kind of like that. So they actually have a file, a text file, that has all that information in the file that tells everything where to go. But when it prints out, it's printing out as dots. And when it's on your screen, it's showing up as vectors. And sometimes that translation from vector to raster, called rasterization, that's the process, uh, doesn't work that well. And they have to use something called hinting, which actually puts information in the font file that helps it render the fonts a little bit better. Another helping device that they use that you'll see sometimes is called anti-aliasing. And what it does, you can see a picture over here, it puts semi-transparent pixels on the edges, so it basically softens the edges. So when you read fonts on screen, they look smoother. They don't look blurry, they just look smoother. But if they didn't have that, they would look very jagged. So it softens it so it doesn't look as jaggy. It just kind of smooths the edges a little bit. And it's very subtle, so you're not always going to see it unless you really zoom in. These fonts are really zoomed in here. But that's anti-aliasing, and hinting is basically the process that helps translate vector to raster, basically the way it's printed out or basically the way it shows up on screen. So that's what those things are. And what really changed things, particularly in graphics, but with computers too, is the PostScript Type 1 fonts. And if you wonder why Adobe is, is such so dominant in the graphics field is because they came up with PostScript technology and they own the patent to it. So, you know, they're still the dominant player. They came up with PostScript Type 1 fonts. And this was a vector font format that was, that was very popular and everybody only used PostScript Type 1 fonts. When I worked at printers, uh, they would say, don't mess around with true type fonts, only use PostScript Type 1 fonts because these were the quality fonts that you used. And they're basically a font suitcase that had a screen font and an outline font built into it. Now, just to give you an idea, I'm just going to grab a font folder here. And these are just fonts I downloaded. Now, here's one called Aachen BT. Now, when I click on this and I scroll over here, I can see this is the outline font. There's an outline font for the bold, and there's an outline font for the Roman. There's the outline font. That's the postscript information. And then there's also the font suitcase, which is really the screen font, which has the Roman and the bold built together. So that's the way type 1 fonts used to work. These are type 1 fonts, and they basically would have one file that was the suitcase or the screen font and one file which were the outline fonts and they kind of work together so when you you saved fonts when you were working on a print job and you had to save the fonts and send it to the printer you had to gather all this stuff together and software like InDesign and PageMaker used to collect all these fonts for you and used to manage all these fonts with a type manager which I'll talk about later but that's the way type 1 fonts work they would have a suitcase so there'd be all these fonts to manage and sometimes there'd be a lot of them it would be hard to keep track of all of them you have to look through all of them you could see these are not type 1 fonts because they are OTF they're open type which we'll talk about but type 1 fonts especially if it was a big family that had a lot of fonts you had them you had to keep track of all these. This only has Roman and bold because it's kind of like a slab serif font. But if there was a Garamond, there could be 10, 11 fonts there. You know, each one for the italic, the bold italic, and all that. And other fonts here that I'll just kind of point out, just going in my system font folder here, you could see these are true type fonts uh, that are kind of used now. Even the TTC are a type of true font. They say true type font collection. And the TTF are true type fonts as well. And these were kind of a cheaper font, and they had the screen font and the outline font built in, so you only needed one font file per typeface. So if you had a bold, you still needed one for the bold, and you still needed one for the italic, although some of them had them built in, like Times New Roman and things like that. But you didn't need a screen font, a separate file for that anymore. So it was easier to keep track of them. And they were actually cheaper. You could download them cheaper, but people said the quality wasn't as good. Printers didn't like getting true type fonts because they said there would be, uh, they would have problems with them, with the kerning and the tracking. They would always prefer type 1 fonts would work better on their output devices. 
And, you know, that's not an issue as much anymore with PDF, but that was a big issue in the 2000s that I dealt with all the time. So true type fonts kind of came on after that. So going back to here, after type 1 fonts, they talk about type 3 fonts. I never really used type 3 fonts, so I'm not really going to talk about it. And they kind of mentioned that it had problems, so I don't even know why they're talking about it. Uh, but true type fonts came on, and that was kind of developed by Apple, and it was promoted by Microsoft. Microsoft used all these true type fonts on their systems. That's where I learned about true type fonts was on Windows systems because they were free and you could download them and you could just load them in your system and use all these true type fonts. I used to work on Corel Draw and they would have all these true type fonts that would get downloaded uh, with the software that you could use. And they would even have names that, that would mimic names of real fonts because they were like knockoffs. That's why they said not to use them because they said they, were, they weren't legitimate fonts. But true type fonts became real popular and they still are now and they've, they've improved in quality so there's not, a, there's not a stigma about true type fonts anymore. But true type was developed by Apple surprisingly they became really popular with microsoft if windows machines seem to use true type fonts more than you'd ever really deal with them on apple machines what was nice about them is that they could work cross platform so you could use true type fonts on a mac operating system and on a windows operating system then after that open type fonts came out which was kind of like true type fonts except adobe and microsoft joined to create this and it was still one file again that could be cross-platform and had the screen information and had the outline information. And when I go here, you'll see a lot of these open type fonts. Now, I don't see these much in my system. Here's a couple here. Lucida are ones that you'll see a lot. Here's one, Last Resort, some of these that are on, on a Mac. Let me go to a different font folder here. Here's my font folder. I'll see a lot of true type and I'll see a lot of open type. You see a lot of that coming with Adobe now. So if you install something like Illustrator, you'll see a lot of OTF fonts. And here's all these o OTF fonts that you'll see here in the list. Now, these are type 1 fonts. Here's geometric. It's type 1. If I click on this, that's actually not a true type. It's a postscript type outline font. I think that I put in there. But you'll also see a lot of these open type fonts that come with the operating system. Some of these foreign fonts and things like that are all OTF, are open type fonts. And they work fine, and, and they, work, they work excellent. I use the, the Minion in Illustrator all the time, and the Myriad, and all that kind of stuff. So you know, they're fine as well. So, you know, there's not as much issue about a font anymore. People aren't clamoring to tell you to use a type one font anymore, especially with some of these new technologies. Now, going back here, I don't think you need to know much about multiple master fonts. I remember that was a way that it, they showed up on PDFs and they could kind of create different sizes and widths and glyphs and things like that. But I never really used them much. And it even says, I think they discontinued technology, lack of interest. See, I wasn't into it. Uh, and nobody else was into it either. Uh, clear type is uh, technology. I don't know a lot about this either. I haven't heard a lot about this. And again, this is an older book, an older textbook. So I don't know if this kind of came and went or this is something that's really popular. But I never heard a lot about clear type fonts. But anyway, these were designed to allow unprecedented precision for screen type on LCD displays. Uh, liquid crystal display. So your, your flat panel monitors and things like that. So they were designed for that. CRT are the older screens that had the deep backs on them, uh, which were a little bit different as far as the way they, they generated the pixels on screen. But I, I haven't heard a lot about clear type, but just know that it's for uh, LCD. Web open font format. I think I mentioned that earlier. That was something where you could use the font face property and the cascading style sheet. Uh, where you can actually embed it into your web page, but we still use that with Google Fonts, but we don't really, I've never heard it really called web open font format. You could still use this at font face property, but uh, usually when you're using Google Fonts, you're just pulling them from a remote server. So when you're using web fonts, that's what's happening. There's a section here on type management software. You probably don't know anything about that, but I use this stuff for years. I use suitcase and one called like font juggler or something. They had all these different names and you would use them to manage your fonts on your computer uh, because you could have, you know, thousands of fonts on your computer and what would happen is they would slow down your software if you launched illustrator and you had like a thousand fonts loaded and you had that big menu of fonts it would slow you down so you would go into your font manager software like atm deluxe or fontbook mac had fontbook built in then which which is nice to use and we use that in the mac lab but then you could go here and you can actually create collections of fonts you could create collections of fonts to use for a certain client i like to do it to create collections of fonts uh, when i teach students about sans serif fonts and serif fonts so that we we actually put them in that category so we put all the sans serif fonts together we do that plus you can disable fonts that you're not using so if there's 
hundreds of fonts that you're not using, you can disable them and it helps your computer run a little bit better. At least that's what they always used to say. So we used to use font management software. Plus it's easier to add fonts. So when you need to install a font on a Mac, you could just go to Fontbook and say, uh, file add fonts and it'll put it here and it'll put it in a fonts folder for you and activate it and you could also turn off fonts turn on fonts here so that's what font manager software is I don't know if people use it that much anymore like they used to people used to use this all the time and I used to teach this all the time in graphic design classes but uh, there was suitcase I never used font case there was master juggler ATM deluxe but since font book was on a Mac it worked fine in a Mac and a lot of people just would use that here they're talking about software we used to use InDesign and Quark Express were the desktop publishing uh, software of the 90s and 2000s. Adobe InDesign is probably the, the top one now. And a lot of this uses now all, all, all three. You could be using, just like when you saw my font folders, you'll see PostScript Type 1 fonts, you'll see True Type, and you'll see Open Type. So that's pretty much what's being used now. And you probably don't even think about it as much anymore. What people try to do is just don't design with system fonts. You know, try to avoid designing with Lucida, Georgia, or things that are just default on your system, and Arial and stuff like that, and, and actually use more typographic fonts that we've learned about, more traditional fonts. Now, I know we use Google fonts a lot of times in this class because they're just more available when we go into Gravit, but, you know, that was always the case. Stay away from system fonts because it's fonts that everybody has. Now, in web, everybody had to use system fonts because you, you could only use fonts that were on people's computers. So everybody designed web pages with Arial and Times New Roman and Helvetica and stuff like that, and you never varied from that. But now, with Google fonts, you could specify your own fonts, and it'll just pull the font from a remote server and be able to use that on a web page. It makes things a lot nicer, and then you don't have to you don't have to embed fonts in a web page or anything like that. Then when people go to that web page, it'll basically pull that from a server and use that particular font, just that style that you need. Not every single style, maybe just the regular. Maybe if you just need a bold for a headline, it'll do that. But that's kind of where where things are are at now, I guess. Uh, now this is even older kind of stuff because you probably never even heard of an image setter. I heard about this because I remember when there, you only had laser printers and they weren't as good as image setters. And even laser printers were only like 300 dpi. The early Apple laser writers and things like that, they were 300 dpi. So they look very jagged when you print it out. So uh, now laser printers are very sharp and clean. You, you don't see you know edges and dots too much on them. You hardly see dots on a, on a halftone image, on a grayscale image anymore. But image setters is where you would actually get crisp text and they would print them out on film either on kind of a glossy kind of paper or even a film to make negatives from an image setter and you had to take it somewhere you didn't have an image setter in house uh, just you know printers and design agencies sometimes would have an image setter in house and it was kind of a photographic process it was an expensive process you wouldn't have an image setter at home but then uh, even laser printers were very expensive especially the high resolution laser printers people didn't have them at home people started getting inkjets at home and at first they're their resolution was very low, but now inkjets can be very sharp. You can print out a lot of stuff with inkjets, but this is kind of like the, you know, the low, better, best kind of thing for years. Now, you know, pe people don't really notice that much anymore because, you know, inkjet printer technology has come a long way and it looks very sharp. Uh, the, the way they generate text. So text doesn't look as bad as it used to. It doesn't look quite like an image setter would, but uh, people's requirements aren't as high anymore because People are viewing so much on screen now. People aren't viewing print as much as they used to. Now, if you're reading a book or a textbook, it's still going to be output with an image setter, but most people are kind of viewing things kind of in this laser printer mode, which is, again, a lot better now. So, again, whenever this book was published, things have come a long way. Now, they talk about some printing things here, trapping and knockouts. I'm not going to ask you that. And they also talk about kinetic type, which I guess they're talking about animated type and things like that, you know, which actually started in the 60s with motion graphics. But kinetic type, just remember that term, is referring to type that actually has movement in it. We used to do that with flash, uh, make kind of animated type with flash. But kinetic, just remember that term. And I think that's all you have to know for this chapter. So hopefully this helps out just a little bit, you know, just going back from my, my background of type going from you know a very print background then going into web it gets confusing with all these uh, different types of type but remember it went from kind of a screen font then it went to outline fonts it was postscript type 1 fonts from adobe and then there was true type which was apple and microsoft and then there was open type which was actually adobe and microsoft which is kind of the, the more modern kind of type now used for print but like i said we use a lot of google fonts on screen we use gravit we use google fonts all this stuff that we use in here uh, when we use fonts in here, let me zoom out a second here, 
these are all Google fonts. So these are all pulling them from the Google server. And there's a ton of them, and they're nice quality. And we could they're outline fonts, so we could turn them into outlines. So, you know, things are kind of going in that direction a little bit. A lot, of, a lot is changing in graphics because of, you know, we're going less print. We're going more devices. People are viewing things on phones and, you know, not just computers anymore, but phones and tablets, all kinds of things. So people use their phones as computers. So things have changed a lot. Resolutions of screens have changed a lot. But, you know, hopefully what we cover this semester, you know, I just wanted to go over a little bit of, of that kind of history of digital type that I went through. But good typography is focusing on readability, making sure everything reads well. So short line lengths, spreading out letting when you can, spreading out tracking when you can for headlines, maybe tightening up letting, tightening up tracking for headlines a little bit, but just making sure readability is always key and, and using fonts that, that don't clash with each other, that get your message across and are clean and easy to read. That's always going to be good design. That's always going to be good typography. So hopefully I could leave you with that uh, with, with this presentation.